Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial and you can choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash the DOM or text the DOM to 500-500. Hello my beautiful watchers. By your leave, I would like to start this episode with a fun and interesting personal story. When I was a kid, right after I got access to the internet, I downloaded the designs for a basic steam engine, a smoothbore musket, and the recipe for gunpowder and memorized them just in case I ever ended up back in time and needed something to help me survive there. I've also toyed with the idea of getting them tattooed on myself somewhere just in case I forget them, and also because it would be really funny. Uh, this probably gives you some sort of idea of how many time travel based stories I've experienced and how much I thought about them over the years. Time travel as a plot device is something of a paradox for me because I find it simultaneously fascinating and extremely boring. The former because it's just such a potential filled concept to explore, and the latter because it's become so overused and so seldom done with much creativity, tending to rely on the same half a dozen or so established tropes. For real, Every single science fiction based TV show has at least one time travel episode, and it is an entire genre of books and films. Like I said, I've experienced a lot of them, and regarding the ones that involved a modern person travelling back to medieval times or further, the thing that kept nagging at me was the lingering thought that it was a damn shame that the out of time person was always of a profession that was of little to no use to their predicament. They were always someone who could be humorously overwhelmed by the ferocity and hardship of the past, and have to cobble together some way of impressing his way out of situations using what little technology he brought with him, or, I don't know, using pop culture references. I wish that just once the time traveller could be a scientist, or an inventor, or an engineer, someone who has the know-how to single-handedly make a serious change to the world around them. It turns out that story not only exists, it's existed since the 19th century, predating all the formulaic modern cliches regarding the genre. A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court was written by American author Samuel Langhorne Clemens, and published under his famous pen name Mark Twain in 1889. Twain is one of the most celebrated writers and humorists of his era. Era. His works include literary household names like The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. One of the first things I learned about this book was just how badly it was received in my homeland of Great Britain, which uh, obviously spiked my curiosity no end. Having now read it and mostly enjoyed it, I can safely say that a modern Englishman is probably not in much danger of having their monocle popped by it, but I can see why my ancestors might have been a bit butthurt. I'll come back to this once I've synopsized the plot. This book is described as a comedy, but I don't know, that almost doesn't do it justice. Due to the absurdity of the concept and how seriously it doesn't take itself, it could certainly claim the title of comedy, but it has more depth and emotional weight at times than many tragedies can claim. As you've no doubt deduced from the title, this book not only includes time travel, but also the legend of King Arthur, specifically the more famous tales from Le Mort d'Arthur. For more information, consider subscribing to sarcastic productions to partake of their education and entertainment. As it's generally agreed by all but the most sentimentally optimistic of historians that King Arthur is an entirely fictional creation, it's pretty clear this book isn't going for any serious realism when it comes to historical accuracy. Which I am okay with. I mean, I do like it when these time travel books go the extra mile to try to be historically accurate, but I've always been okay with the, ah, screw it, let's mix in a little fantasy take on it. Anyways, uh, let's talk about the plot to this particular take on the time travel formula. The book, set in the at the time contemporary late 19th century is written in a way not dissimilar to the Phantom of the Opera in that Twain writes in the first person about meeting a character from the story and hearing the events of it from him, implying, though with much less commitment than Gaston Leroux, that the events of the story are in some way true. Or at least I assume this is the case because the man narrating the prologue and the epilogue marks his initials as MW, which I suppose could be a coincidence, but... He claims to have been touring Warwick Castle and comes across a very old American traveller who he got to talking to at the pub that they were both staying at. After a few stiff drinks, his new friend is convinced to recount the events of his life, though after the first chapter or so he just hands over his journal for him to read at his leisure and heads to bed claiming fatigue. The mysterious American's name was Hank Morgan and he claims to have been a time traveller. Hailing from Connecticut, he was the son of a blacksmith, trained as a general engineer and employed in an arms factory where his skills in gun making raised him to the rank of superintendent over several thousand men. Morgan is not a man for lengthy intros apparently because all of this is summarised within a few sentences before he explains that he eventually got into a fight with a large dis 
disgruntled underling who smacked him around the head with a crowbar so hard he flew not only into another country, but also through time itself. Awakening from this titanic blow to the cranium upon the Isle of Britain in the 6th century, Morgan is immediately taken captive by a knight errant by the name of Kay. Kay decides, based on his outlandish garb, that he must be a sorcerer or rogue, and takes him to Camelot to be sentenced before King Arthur and the Knights of the Table Round. At first believing the knight to be mad and Camelot an insane asylum, when he realises the truth, Morgan immediately decides that, as he was by default the most advanced and best educated man in the time period, he should probably go ahead and take over the country. The plan seems immediately derailed by him being sentenced to death by burning at the stake, but despite the court wizard Merlin's best efforts, Morgan manages to get himself out of execution using one of the first examples of what would later become a popular time travel trope, the very conveniently timed total solar eclipse. By the way, I had no idea that was based on a real event. Man, Christopher Columbus was a dick. By predicting and taking credit for this eclipse, he convinces king and court that he is the world's most powerful wizard and demands that he be made Arthur's new right-hand man and prime minister. In exchange, he promises to introduce new technologies and education to the nation, boosting its economy. He realises that Merlin, the vindictive old man who tried so hard to get him killed, is just a con-man magician like himself, but one that has come to believe in his own legend, so solidifies his position by ousting him from court by performing another great feat of magic, i.e. blowing up Merlin's tower with some newly invented sticks of dynamite. After some time as the de facto minister of the country, he picks up the unofficial title of The Boss, and develops a... Well, not exactly a friendship, but a good working relationship with King Arthur. Something that becomes immediately apparent regarding this king and kingdom, and one of the plot twists that turn the British off this book, is the fact that Merlin is clearly not the only one who fails to live up to his fables. King Arthur and his knights seem well-intentioned, but no matter how much Morgan comes to like them as people, he cannot get over the fact that they are an absolute monarch and nobility presiding over a feudal system with all the unbelievably vast social unfairness that comes with that. Their sense of honour, justice and chivalry only only applied to other people of equal rank, and to them the idea that the many serfs and slaves of the nation might deserve some modicum of basic human rights as well was an offensively stupid idea to be scoffed at. On top of that, it quickly becomes more than obvious that every fantastical achievement attributed to Lancelot, Galahad and the other Knights of the Round Table are all in reality pretty mediocre events exaggerated out of all proportion by the Knights themselves. Eventually, a fair damsel in distress by the name of Sandy turns up in Camelot, claiming to have just escaped a dark castle filled with likewise imprisoned princesses and fair maidens, and guarded by giant evil ogres. No one except the boss thinks to question the honesty or credentials of this woman in any way, and all of the knights clamour to get to be the brave man to ride with Sandy back to this cursed castle and rescue her compatriots. However, genuinely believing that he is heaping glory on his new minister, Arthur charges a less than enthusiastic Morgan with the quest. The trip there is an absolute nightmare for Morgan, who is dressed in full plate mail armour and hating every second of it. As I am exactly the kind of nerdy bastard who has tried on various suits of armour in my time, I really felt this chapter. Even the best made, custom fitted armour is so, so uncomfortable, like holy shit, like you have to have spent your entire adult life practising with it every day to even be able to swing a sword in combat, you know? Everything else is virtually impossible and an act of excruciating agony. Side note, I spent ages looking for good pictures of me in armour, but apparently none exist because my college days predate phones having decent cameras on them. I'm old. Anyways, along the journey, Morgan gets more first-hand examples of the plight of the downtrodden masses of Britain's lower class, and his hatred for the current political system that would allow such a small percentage of the population to live in extreme wealth, while the vast majority work themselves to death, increases tenfold. The worst example of noble abuse is when he becomes the guest of Arthur's sister, Morgan Le Fay. He witnesses her stab a young page boy to death for tripping and touching her gently. Using his clout as the boss, Morgan orders Le Fay to empty out her castle's dungeons and frees half a hundred people who'd been imprisoned there and subjected to unspeakable tortures for decades for little to no reason. When they eventually get to Sandy's castle, it turns out to be a literal pigsty. The young lady clearly has a somewhat tenuous grip on reality, as she perceives the swine as fair princesses and the herders as mighty ogre. In an act of kindness, Morgan plays along and simply buys the pigs to rescue them. On the way home, he passes through a holy valley that's inhabited by an order of monks who look after a supposedly magic well. The well 
Skull has dried up. They believe due to dark magic, though a close inspection by Morgan reveals it is simply cracked inside. Merlin has been there a while, waving his hands around and saying magic words, but to no avail. To top up his reputation as a miracle worker, Morgan pretends to do a dramatic exorcism on the well after fixing it, setting off a ton of fireworks and rigging up a new iron pump he just invented to spurt the returned water into the air. And when he gets back to Camelot, he decides to spend some time traveling the land dressed as a peasant to get a better feel for the kingdom. To his slight surprise, King Arthur insists on joining him, so he ends up spending most of the trip failing to keep his majesty out of trouble and trying to show him the error of his system of government. So then, sire, we have been upon the road for a few days now, and we have already barely avoided being run down and beaten to death by nobles for no discernible reason on at least three occasions. And do you perhaps think this is enough evidence to consider changing the way things work in this country of yours? No, of course not. It is the right of the highborn and all that is due to him under law that he may preside above his inferiors. Sir, now that we have watched some sweet innocent folk literally die before our eyes due to the oppressive hand of the aristocracy, maybe now you would like to rethink your system of government just a little. Not at all. This state of things is nothing less than the divine will of God himself, who thought his wishes would be the greatest sin of all. Your Majesty, seeing as we have been captured and sold into slavery on the whims of a cool-minded baron who is under no obligation according to your laws to give us a chance to prove our freeman's status, do perchance you see a little something wrong with this picture. I can't believe you sold for more than me. Okay. We are about to be hung by the neck for the simple act of having defended our lives from the cruel and murderous slave masters. Sire, for the love of all that is sacred in this heaven and earth, will you please admit that this nation requires some immediate improvements in regards to equality? Oh, very well. <laughs> Slavery is henceforth abolished. Shut it down. Shut it all the fuck down. This is Morgan's first huge positive step in the betterment of the nation. The next is when he's challenged to a duel to the death by one of the Knights of the Round Table, and he defeats first him, and then every last one of them with nothing but a cowboy's lasso. He hopes that this crushing, humiliating defeat will effectively end the era of chivalry with all its lies and double standards. The only slight hitch comes when Merlin steals his lasso, and the first knight returns to challenge him again. This turns out to only be bad news for the knight, though, as Morgan, a weaponsmith, has had all the time he needs to reinvent his special item. After that, he reveals the vast network of factories and schools that he's been building in secret across Arthur's kingdom. In light of him having kicked the asses of the most famous warriors in the country, and with the king's favor, no one attempts to stop him from reshaping the nation as he sees fit. The story then skips ahead three years. England has already gone through most of the Industrial Revolution, and now sports trains, phone lines, mass production, and the beginnings of general education. Sandy, despite being slightly mad and a little slow on the uptake, had really grown on Morgan, so he had married her, and they'd had a child together together that she had named Hello Central, mistaking the words that he would say into his new telephone for a person of great importance to his past. Morgan has big plans for phasing out the monarchy and declaring England a republic, already having gained Arthur's approval to do this upon his death. However, his more immediate concern is his infant daughter, who was taken ill. He's advised to try taking her abroad for her health, so he takes his family and sails to northern France to stay in a small friendly kingdom there for a while. Morgan eventually realizes that he has had no word from Britain in the entire time he's been away, so he returns home alone. To his horror, he discovers that everything has gone all kinds of tits up while he was gone. It turns out that one of the very few Arthurian legends that was entirely on the money was Lancelot bonking Queen Guinevere behind Arthur's back. Arthur had discovered his wife's infidelity right after Morgan left and attempted to have her executed. Lancelot had rescued her, killing a dozen knights in the process, and sparked off a civil war. Morgan Le Fay's son, Prince Mordred, had taken the opportunity to attack his uncle, and after a disastrous battle for both sides, he and King Arthur ended up killing each other. With England bereft of leadership, the Catholic Church had seized power and imposed religious rule over the entire country, and were now in the process of systematically undoing all of Morgan's advancements, both economical and technological. In the only act of defiance available to him, Morgan fortifies one of Merlin's old caves and tells the church where to find him. He only has access to 52 soldiers, but all the modern hardware he's been producing over the last few years, including landmines, three rows of electric fences, and half a hundred frickin' gatling guns. The church fields 30,000 mounted knights against him, which is pretty much every surviving knight left in England at this point. Despite this massive colossal imbalance in numbers, Morgan isn't super worried about them. However, to his dismay, thousands upon thousands of the common folk joined the enemy army as well. Men he had been working tirelessly to finally raise the status of and afford human rights to, chose to take up arms against him, scream death to his republic, and restore the status quo. His hope is that the nobility will attack first and be wiped out by his superior firepower, which will then cause the common folk to run away with minimal casualties. This is exactly what happens. All 30,000 
noble men meet their end either through explosions, electrocution, or the hail of bullets from their opponent's guns. However, this is ultimately not a victory for the Republic forces. They are just too small in number to be able to go on the offensive, and they can't retake the country from inside a cave. Worse, Morgan insists on trying to help the wounded, and is stabbed by an ungrateful knight. While he's recovering, Merlin infiltrates his cave, dresses a woman, and supposedly puts a spell on him that will make him sleep for 13 centuries, returning him to his own time. While doing a victory dance over having finally rid himself of his nemesis, Merlin makes the mistake of touching one of the electric fences. In a postscript to his journal, one of Morgan's loyal troops explained that they intend to hide his slumbering body in the back of the cave, and then expect to slowly die off of illness brought about by being surrounded by 30,000 rotting corpses. Back in the 19th century, Mark Twain is amazed by the account he has just read, and goes to find Morgan upstairs. He unfortunately discovers him on his deathbed, calling out for Sandy and their daughter. In his delirium, he believes he is hearing the trumpets of King Arthur approaching one last time, and tries to give his final order that the king be made welcome before slipping away. This book has a far more emotionally distressing ending than a comedy has any right to. Damn Twain. I wasn't ready. Going back to the time travel genre in general for just a second, uh, there's a lot of ways that authors handle the possible outcomes of meddling with the past and the paradoxes that come with it. For example, the classic, if you go back in time and prevent a bad thing from happening, then it will not have happened and you will have had no reason to go back and prevent it, thus it would happen, causing you to go back and prevent it, repeat ad infinitum. Available options include, but are not limited to. There's the, yes, you totally can change the present from the past for good or bad, uh, this one tends to to ignore the paradox outright. The no, the time traveling you did already happened even before you knew you did it, so anything you do in the past will have the same result in your present no matter what. The parallel universe theory, where your changing of the past creates an alternative timeline allowing your experienced reality and this new one you've set into motion to coexist paradox free. And the one where the time traveler can't or chooses not to return to their own time, so we never know what effect they had. Assuming that you believe that Hank Morgan did in fact time travel and wasn't simply delusional from the crowbar whack to the head, which, let's face it, is actually the most likely outcome, then Twain went with option two. No matter how much Morgan thought that he was changing the world, Britain apparently just wasn't ready for it and chose to undo all his work and go back to having to figure it all out for themselves over the next thousand years or so. You also see that no matter how much King Arthur's life was changed by Morgan, it still ended the same way, with everything getting so fucked up between him, Lancelot, Guinevere, and Prince Mordred. An interesting thing about this book is the consistent message that magic and superstition are not real and will always use yield before science. Uh, but for that to make sense, you have to sort of ignore the bit at the beginning and end where he, you know, travels through time. Uh, again, assuming it's not all just in the main character's head. While King Arthur himself probably wasn't real, his system of government and the way it's been super romanticized over the years has a lot more historical weight behind it. My reaction to the Knights of Rant were garbage and his wife theme was pretty much just... Yeah. It's really not that radical an opinion anymore. Heck, it was one of the main themes of Game of Thrones before the writing dropped into a cesspool. That oligarchy ending came out of nowhere and made no sense, you f- oh, Don't look all in I don't want you to see me like this. But, like I said, it doesn't surprise me that 19th century Britain, with its world-spanning empire and overwhelming sense of superiority, had a bit of a stick up its ass at the idea that a Yank would dare to write about one of our greatest legends being a bit of a prick when you get to know him. The depiction of all of Britain, from the highborn to the low, as uber-gullible sheeple probably didn't help much either. In the age-old story of the enlightened traveller trying to educate the ignorant savages, this was probably the first time that we'd been cast in the role of the savage, so that no doubt bruised some Egos. However, Britain may well have taken this story far too personally because Twain seems to have intended his mockery of the 6th century nobility to double up as a criticism of the modern social norms of his own America and all other countries that labour under the yoke of a system that allows a very small amount of people to be fantastically more wealthy than the rest of their nation. What's really disturbing is just how perfectly his 19th century warning about the colossal dangers of said upper class and the disturbing trend of those downtrodden beneath them to become so accustomed to the system that perpetuates them, they will literally fight to maintain it, even when presented with alternatives can apply to the world we find ourselves in in the year of our Lord 2020. Please vote this November. Because, yeah, it seems that we still have a lot to learn from Mark Twain. The dude manages to stay relevant whether he's writing about the past, present, or future. If I have successfully interested you in this novel, then you'll be happy to know it's available for download right now on Audible. You could even listen to it for no charge with their 30-day free trial, as you get a completely free audiobook along with two Audible originals. Audiobooks open up a world of multitasking possibilities for the book lover on the go. Since signing up to Audible, I have no longer had to choose between my beloved books and activities where 
I really shouldn't be reading. Uh, driving, for one, that's a big no-no. Uh, trying to read on a treadmill, that was a pretty painful experience the one time I tried it. Audible has an unmatched library of audiobooks, so if this one doesn't pique your interest, perhaps you might enjoy the subject of last week's episode, The Witcher Books by Andrzej Sapkowski. There are no strings attached to the introductory offer, you can quit any time you like, and you get to keep the free audiobook, so there's literally no reason not to follow the link in the video description and visit audible.com slash the dom, or text the dom to 500 500. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. While Knights Errant might have been disappointingly full of shit, you can still be a hero to me by tilting your lance at the dreaded YouTube algorithm in the form of likes, comments, and shares on social media. If you're new here, do consider subscribing to keep abreast of new content, have a most pleasant day, and I will see you soon. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz and Matthew J. Brish. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the Dom, I can't do that, for you see, I am of the Fremen, and we use water as currency here on Arrakis. I mean, you can have some if you really want, but I'm not sure how much use you're going to get out of it. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. I'll just say the line with you here and just not acknowledge your existence. Ow. Will you please admit that this nation requires some immediate improvements in regards to equality? I don't know what accent I was going for there. Gotta be, gotta, gotta channel Daniel Craig from Knives Out. Well, I'm, I do apologize. Yeah. I'm gonna get ripped apart in the comments for this, uh, for this accent. I just know it. Oh, valley of plenty, oh, valley of plenty. Is it 13 centuries? 13 plus 6. Yeah, okay. Maths. I just said that line while a cat slowly came over and sat down on my foot, being very ticklish. You tested me and I passed the test, said Terry. Do not bite my foot, you little shit. Don't give me that look, you're trying to bite me. See, I'm trying to say his name, but my I instinctively think, oh no, if I say Twain, I'm, it sounds like I'm lisping, so I automatically try to change it to Train. But that's not his name, so it's no good. Help! Save me from the crazy human! Help!